the surrounding communities of these pig farms are predominantly people of color. They're not doing it around rich, suburban, white neighborhoods. Hi, I'm Leila Tehran. I'm an Iranian living in London, and I have been vegan for over six years. Hello, my name is John Lewis, AKA Badass Vegan. I have been vegan for 15 years now, and I live in Miami, Florida. So you're a nationally certified fitness trainer. You're a speaker. You have a bachelor's degree in marketing, a master's in business. You are the founder and CEO of the brand Badass Vegan. Uh -huh. And most recently, you have actually co-directed the documentary Hungry for Justice. We actually have changed the name of the film to They're Trying to Kill Us Now. Hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Priyamba Naik. I'm a board certified physician in the U.S. Um, my specialties are pulmonary medicine, critical care medicine, and lifestyle medicine. I have been vegetarian for about a year and a half, and my mother was actually diagnosed with colon cancer. And learning from the doctors, uh, talking to them and, and doing my own research, I saw that, you know, that this, this type of disease was exactly related to what we ingest. So I remember asking the doctors, like, how did this happen? And he's like, too much animal protein, fried fatty foods. I'm like, wait, so this is not hereditary? He's like, no, not at all. This is a lifestyle choice. And for me, that, that stuck out for me because... You know, I'm a big believer in learning from my mistakes, but I'm a bigger believer in learning from everybody's mistakes. So if I see you try to run through that wall behind you and you don't make it, I'm not going to try to say, you know what, let me show you how to run through this wall. Like, no, I'm not going to do that. I was already vegetarian. I was like, you know what, this is just that last little step. Let me just do it. And, and in all honesty, I it made me think, I wish I would have went vegan just right out of the gate instead of that you know, one and a half, two years of uh, vegetarianism because I really wasn't missing anything. What do, do you feel like you benefited most actually from being a vegan or going vegan? Did you see any health benefits immediately? I would say a ton, uh, actually. Pain is a necessary force of life. We're supposed to have pain, you know, that, that lets us know if we went too far or something's wrong. So pain is a part of life, but pain shouldn't be an everyday thing. And I think that's where, you know, I started to see like, wow, like I'm not feeling these pains. And I've had surgery on both knees. I got a plate in my wrist, you know, being an athlete, just different surgeries, a broken foot, um, I, everything. So I noticed that these pains were just not gone. And then, you know, I work out still like I did when I was in college. I, I'm 43 now. So everybody always thinks I'm like a kid. And I'm like, no, I'm 43, you know, like skin, I used to have bad acne, like horrible acne. I was overweight. It was uh, all these different things and it just started to like, just get better. And then a, a key thing that I noticed was everybody in my immediate family is on some kind of medication, everybody. And I'm the only one not on medication. And so that was a telltale sign that I was doing something right. It's hard to get, it's hard to get rid of the brainwashing that, that has happened to us over years because that brainwashing, we turn into traditions. And so it's like, you're going against tradition, no matter how bad the tradition is affecting us or hurting us or harming us, it's hard for us to let go. Like I, I remember talking to a 40 year old man, I never forget this day. You can see the literal fear in his eyes because he said that he couldn't go vegan because his mom would kill him if he didn't eat his food. And I was like, you're 40 years old, bro. Like. <laughs> But that fear is really there. Like there's so many different conditions that people have to shake in order to do this. And, and for me, it just, I didn't care about tradition. I didn't care about norm. I noticed that your traditions also were leading us to these debilitating diseases. And it was like, why would I go down that path? If I see we're all doing the same thing and we're getting the same results, it's time to change it. Now my kids, my kids are vegan. My wife is vegan. Um, but like my mother and brothers and cousins and no. <laughs> I've had a couple of family members that have uh, seen the documentary and they're like, okay, I got to do it now. So that's a, that, that makes me feel good, you know, like uh, to see the people that have seen, that have been around me for years, but they saw this piece of film that I put together and they're like, you know what? 
you sold me. I got to do it now. I always wanted to be a veterinarian uh, growing up. In fact, I have a cousin that was our life goals and she is a veterinarian now. Mm. Um, and so like animal welfare was always something in the back of my head, but then I ate meat. So I felt like a hypocrite. And a lot of my friends know like, I'm a big, big, big stickler on not being a hypocrite. I don't ever want to be a hypocrite. I don't ever want to, I don't ever want to like condemn somebody for eating meat, knowing that I personally was a butcher at one point. Like I literally was a butcher. So like, it's kind of hard for me to like, condemn someone so I wanted to show people that no matter where you come from no matter what you've been through you can change and that was a big big reason for me like sharing so much of my platform I think I think we all have our own journey you know like that's I think that's what people fail to realize a lot of times especially us as vegans we 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 become vegan and we're like well why is not why isn't everybody vegan we're like well wait a minute it took you however long for your journey to start you know I there's a lady, and I'm, I'm so sorry, I forget her name. She's like 80. She's been vegan probably like, uh, like right around when What the Health came out is when she watched it. But she's been vegan since then. It took her to that point. It's just everybody has their own journey. We have to understand that. Sometimes we have to be the one to just plant the seed and move on. And somebody else will water it. Somebody else will cultivate it. Somebody else will you know, trim the leaves when it gets out of control. But it's a process throughout everyone else's. You know, when they say it takes a village, it's almost that kind of attitude. And, uh, you know, sometimes you're just planting a seed and you go on and you might be the one to water it or you might be the one to trim it. You might be the end result. Like, that's why when people always say, oh, my God, you, you're the one that made me go vegan. I'm like, no, I didn't do that. That was you. You, you did that yourself. Your power, you understood your power and you made that decision. Don't, I don't want anybody to, like, give that power away because that's what these ads what we talked about you know they're like you need our product you know if it wasn't for me you wouldn't be able to look pretty or you wouldn't be healthy you need this product and i'm like no we all have that inside of us and we just have to understand it what made you have that uh, uh, mindset that i'm gonna actually kind of build my own path i'm not gonna actually fall into the same trap it's, it's very interesting i think all throughout my life, I was, I always felt different. I just started to pay attention. Like, well, if I need to change it, I can't keep doing the same thing everybody else is doing. Like I was the first one to move away from my family. Like when I moved to Miami, that was like a big deal, like to get away. But I just felt like I couldn't, I couldn't spread my wings around the family the way I wanted to. I still love my family. I still talk to my family. We still love each other. We have our reunions. We do everything. It was just at that time, I couldn't see my growth there. I noticed that that was one big, big, big thing was just noticing that I had to do something different than follow the norm. And I say it all the time, I'm just a normal person. I don't have a special DNA that allowed me to do this. It's just, I wanted it. And along with the want, I turned it into a need. It's like, I need to do this and I have to do this. I don't have another choice. I tell people all the time, I'm, I almost feel like I'm training for this leading role in this action figure movie. And I think that's what kind of leads me in the path. It's like, okay, in order for me to do this, it's not impossible, but I have to do the things to get there. I can't watch somebody else do it. And hopefully the work that they put on gives me results. It doesn't work that way. So we have to put in the work, whether whether the work is being more peaceful, being more happy, being more healthy, it's outside of just working out, like growing mentally, like learning more, reading more. Chef Babette, I love Chef Babette. She's turning 70 and she posted some pictures of her, um, her today, like what she looks like. And people are like, oh my God, you look, and I'm like, no, that's what you're supposed to look like. She's out there working out. She's doing these work. I'm not taking any credit away from her, but that should be the norm. She is a standout, but she's actually what we should be doing. We should be able to, you know, run a marathon at 70 or do all these other adventurous, amazing things. But we've just allowed ourselves to believe that we're not capable of it. And we got to start believing in ourselves again. So have you heard that, you know, people telling you it's a right thing? All or the time all the time, you know, oh, because I'm Indian, uh, you know, oh, Indians, uh, you know, we treat cows well. 
So dairy is good for us. I look at it from the view of colonization, and I don't know enough about Iran's history to comment, but certainly in India, British colonization impacted diet, right? So we weren't heavily invested in dairy and things like that as we are now, right? We weren't large uh, uh, meat eaters either. The problem with that argument with colonization is it's a little bit irrelevant what we used to do, right? In Hinduism, widows used to light themselves on fire when their husbands died, right? I mean, that doesn't mean that we should go back to those things. Slavery was a thing. That doesn't mean that we should go back to those things, right? So we need to move forward in and look at how what we are doing isn't just impacting. So, you know, for me, I'm vegan for the animals, right? But I'd be a fool to not realize that going vegan and getting to a vegan world or as close to that as possible impacts the world over and particularly the global majority, right? When you look at things like the fact that we grow grains in other countries, in poorer countries that are recovering from colonization. But when you look at these countries, they're raising crops and grains and things like that, often in drought stricken areas. And where is that feed going? To wealthy Western nations to feed their animals. This argument that, oh, well, you know, we're from such and such culture, we don't do that. Well, but we should be doing it. Regardless of what we did before, it's not good for our health. You know, diabetes is increasing at a phenomenal rate in India, right? And people go, oh, but we don't understand that. We're, it's a country of vegetarians. And I'm like, right, it's a country of vegetarians, not a country of vegans, but it's not even a country of vegetarians anymore, right? We've adopted all of the negative practices of the West. So now it's very meat oriented. Before the colonization of the world, before this all got mixed up, you know, you think about past African history, obesity wasn't prevalent. You know, uh, heart disease wasn't prevalent. You know, cancers weren't prevalent. Uh, diabetes wasn't prevalent. It's because we've been colonized and now we've inherited these diseases and these bad traits, this eating of these horrible foods, this not caring about anybody else in the world. It's all came from a place of oppression and being forced to think a certain way. But if we remove that word and really just look at the core of what it is, that's been around for millennial millenniums, you know what I'm saying? It's just that, again, something's been whitewashed and it's been whitewashed so well that everybody believes, oh man, that's a white thing, you know, just to go vegan. I have run into this before where even from, you know, people of color or, or melanin rich people is that from time to time they'll be like, oh, you're vegans, oh, so you don't care about human rights. I'm like, no, like, that's a huge part of why I'm vegan. You know, in the film, I actually talk about how, you know, there's these pig farms in North Carolina and the surrounding communities of these pig farms are predominantly people of color. They're not doing it around rich suburban white neighborhoods. They're picking these colors. And so, you know, we did like swab tests and we tested like the walls and the tables and the ovens and the, toys and all that and they all had pig feces in them because that feces travels you know in it's in the water it's in the air you know the the pig farm that we actually went to he had three lagoons one of the lagoons alone holds six million gallons of pig waste and what are they going to do with that pig waste nobody's buying it so they have to spray it over these fields and when they spray it it just catches in the air and goes into these surrounding neighborhoods. People are like, oh, I gotta have my bacon. It's like, okay, so you're supporting that too when you gotta have that bacon. All right, let's get back to the human rights issue. Do you really have to have that bacon over supporting what it's doing to these neighborhoods? So as a pulmonologist, I actually see real world examples 
of some of the diseases that we see from people who work and live near these concentrated animal feed organizations. I tend to use that term over factory farm if I can. I'm not 100% perfect with that because these are not farms. This isn't old McDonald's farm. You know, these are giant industries. You can divide the diseases into three major categories. So there's the occupational and airborne related diseases, pollution related diseases, so that's one. Another one is zoonotic diseases. So the things that we see like pandemics, things like swine flu, these came from these CAFOs. The third one that we see is related to things like um, infections and, and antibiotic resistance. Generally speaking, the people who work in these areas and live in these areas are exposed to everything from organic dust, inorganic dust, mold and fungi and viruses and bacteria that are in the soil, that are in the feed. And we can actually find these, uh, you know, up to a mile away from these concentrated animal feed organizations. So if you're living within that region, you're exposed to these organic dust, inorganic dust, bacteria, viruses, fungi, but you're also going to be exposed if you live near these areas, as you said, to aerosolized feces. Right, so feces are not sterile because it's not just feces, right? It's feces and urine that's being sprayed in liquid form. So if you're inhaling this, whether you actually work in one of these CAFOs or if you live near these areas, you're inhaling them into your lungs and your lungs are really delicate, right? So we see everything from the folks that work there will notice a drop in their lung function and that can be just a temporary thing while they're at work and then they go home if they don't live nearby and it comes back up. But over time, that reversibility goes away. One of the worst things that I have seen is I took care of a patient who worked in what he called a chicken plant. And I put that in quotes because of course it's not a plant, chickens are living beings. Um, and he was exposed to so much ammonia and other chemicals from the feces that he was around in these barns that he developed fatal terminal lung disease. He developed something called chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, which is a scarring lung disease. Sometimes you can treat it by getting people away from that environment. Well, this was a poor rural farmer, disenfranchised, didn't have the ability to just say, oh, I'm just going to go get another job, continue to work there. And this gentleman ultimately died of this disease. From an antibiotic resistance standpoint, because these farms use antibiotics, we uh, have seen in multiple studies, for example, that you are more likely to be colonized with something called MRSA, methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. So they'll try to tell you, oh, but it's just colonization. Okay, but the reason colonization is a problem is because it can become an active infection at any time, right? A good friend of mine who's an infectious disease physician told me about a case of his, a young woman had a multi-drug resistant urinary tract infection. There was absolutely no reason she should have had this particular bacteria or that this particular bacteria should have been multi-drug resistant. They could not find a single reason until he Googled her address. And she lived less than a mile from a CAFO. When we talk about why the farms are in these locations, because you know it's a polluting industry, you know that it's gonna get into the water tables, it's going to start damaging the water supplies, it's going to immediately pollute the air. If you live in the rich white country club area, those people have political power, right? They're gonna know politicians. There's probably politicians living in their country club neighborhoods, right? So those are not the places that they're gonna get the permits to get to put their factory farms, right? However, if you run a CAFO, if you run one of these industries, you know that poor black indigenous and people of color are disenfranchised. They don't have political power. Sometimes it's actually cheaper to eat processed food than oh, yeah. eat vegetables and fruits. So what can we do to help those communities? Somebody having two jobs or whatever the case is, or just busy with family and kids, it's a lot. We have to show them the convenience of the other foods. I, I think in order to replace something that they feel not only is easy, but they feel is a necessity. My, my biggest hack that I always tell people is meal prepping on the day that you are available to do it. You know, like, out of that, if you can't do it all one day, you meal prep one, half one day, 
half another day when you can. And then you make sure that what you're eating too, you actually enjoy. I think that's another big misconception of vegan food is that I'm not gonna like it. It's gonna taste horrible. It's gonna be more expensive. It's like, no, vegan products are more expensive. Just like anything else, when you pay somebody else to do it, you're gonna pay for that. So, you know, and I, and I know that rice and beans are not like the ultimate uh, meal choice for a lot of people because I, I know psychologically a lot of people feel like it's a poverty food to eat rice and beans. So, you know, one thing that I, a trick that I learned, and this is, uh, I always give her credit for this, is uh, Chef Charity Morgan. She always says, make different sauces. So you make like three to four sauces. And what happens is you put different sauces on top of those rice and beans every day. That's another meal. And we're just using rice and beans as an example because there's so many different things. You can do baked butternut squash. You can do you know, lentils, you can do, it's so many different things out there. But if you prep it on a day where you have some time, you'll be amazed how much time it frees up. When you get home from work, the meal's already done. Not only can you rest, but you got time to spend with the family. You got time to work on other things. And that's where we have to show them that it's really not that hard because what we forget is the time it takes to get to McDonald's, the time to sit in that line, the time to wait on somebody else to make your food. You don't know if they had a cold. You don't know if they had there. You know, the quality control is not the same as the can of beans. And I don't recommend cans all the time, but if that's the convenience that you can do or this bag of beans or these fresh fruits or whatever. So we just have to show that convenience is actually there and the taste is there and the benefit of living longer is there. It's important to realize that when we say that, you know, being vegan in and of itself, in my mind, isn't like activism, right? Being vegan is literally to me the equivalent of, you know, I also don't go run around and kick homeless people, right? I mean, I'm literally just doing the least I can do by not actively contributing to harm. But if I want the world to go vegan, then I can't just look at things like animal activism in the sense of protests and things like that. These are all important things. I'm not remotely saying they're not. But we can't get people to go vegan who don't have access to healthy fruits and veggies. We also have to work on legislation, right? So we have to make sure that we're getting rid of these redlining laws, that we're abolishing food apartheid in a meaningful way. So these food justice organizations are working towards that, right? If you go to a poor community, and again, these low-income communities, thank you, thanks to systemic racism, are going to predominantly be black and brown communities. They'll have liquor and they'll have white bread and they'll have animal products, but they won't have fresh fruits and veggies, right? And that's what needs to change. Hi, I'm Carmen from the UK, and I'm the director of Mad Ideas, Marketing and Design in Surrey. I went vegan after watching Earthlings documentary. Wow, it was a life-changing moment for me, but in a good way. I honestly feel being in the fitness industry, being black, did, did give me some kind of advantage. But I think also like, I look I, I look like the part of the, of the professional athlete that's out there now. I'm not a professional athlete, but I look the part, you know, I'm 6'6", 240, uh, in pretty decent shape. So like people look at that like, okay, he got no way he's talking about, no matter what, you know? And I think that's a big thing. And I, I don't know if it was necessarily the color, but I know most of our professional athletes are of color. So I think that did help out. But as far as racism in general, yes, I've definitely felt that and been, a, you know, been accustomed to it, seen it growing up, been a part of it growing up. You know, it's it's just it's just there. It's definitely a part of life. I think the biggest problem why it's not. There's two parts why it's not going away anytime soon. One is that even though racism is term, you know, illegal, that doesn't mean people get rid of racism. You know what I'm saying? That they, they've, been, they've been passing that down since the beginning of time. So it's not gonna stop now. The second part is there are so many people that don't deem themselves racist and they also don't believe that racism still exists because they don't have to go through it. 
So as long as there's people that believe, well, if I don't have to go through it, it's not a real thing. You know, they're just overreacting over there. It's just the same as anything. You know, if if women's rights, if people are like, well, women get treated the same, it's like, ah, actually, no, they don't. You know, but but because they don't go through it, they don't believe it. Even if it's a woman, there might be a woman that's in a in a nice place, living relationship, household, work, career, and they don't feel that it, it happens because they don't go through it. We got to pull the veil back and let people see, no, this is really going on. And it, and one day, one day <laughs> it'll, it'll disappear. Especially people of color who haven't seen it and witnessed it, and they come and say, oh, it doesn't exist. And I think actually it does harm, to be honest. Oh, it does. Oh, it definitely does. Because the people that the people that are white that believe the same thing that it doesn't exist they're like well see this person over here says it doesn't exist too it's like yeah but neither one of you two have ever lived through it so that's why you don't feel it happens you know what i'm saying cuz i think one of the biggest things that the people that deny racism are actually perpetuating racism you know like hey racism doesn't exist that's like me saying you know, obesity doesn't exist. It exists just because I say it doesn't exist, just because I didn't go through it, which I actually did. But people that are out there, if you've never been through something, it's very hard to understand. It's very hard to have empathy for someone or something that you've never been a part of. Like, I think what helps me have more understanding, you know, as a vegan is because I was a butcher. Like, I understand how messed up that is. It was not a clean, healthy environment mm -hmm. at all. One thing that happened to me while I was there, which there was probably other things, but I remember one of the ones that stood, I was having tonsillitis, which was just like, but I was going in and out of this freezer, like constantly. Like it was just in and out of the freezer, back and forth, back and forth. And one day I just woke up and I just felt like my whole throat had just like closed, you know? And, 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 and that's just minor compared to what these other workers are going through. Racism has real, tangible, physical health effects, right? One, one really phenomenal study that just came out. Now, this is a correlation. It's not a causation, but it does need to be looked at. Uh, uh, Duke researchers, I think it was last year, they looked at disease processes in these communities near these hog farms. And not only do they find the same diseases that we've talked about, they found that these folks had lower lifespans, shorter lifespans, even than people in similar socioeconomic statuses in urban areas, right? So this is not because they're poor or because they're a community of color. It is something about that environment. When we talk about things like the spraying of the liquid feces, it's important to realize that the animal agriculture industry doesn't just harm people who work and live there or who are eating the products, right? You and I as vegans are still harmed by these industries. How? Salmonella outbreaks, E. coli outbreaks, right? In uh, lettuces, right? This, you don't get, E. coli and salmonella are uh, GI, they're digestive, right? They're digestive bacteria. Lettuce doesn't have a digestive tract right? It's not that farmers are defecating in the fields. That's not where the E. coli is coming from, right? It's coming from these lagoons of animal waste. So it affects us even if we're not participating in that industry. And people think, oh, whatever, it's just a little diarrhea. No, people die every year. If I could go back, honestly, I would tell myself to just don't get discouraged. Um, you're going to go down a separate path that a lot of people don't go down and you're going to get a lot of resistance but you can handle that resistance and keep going i have always acknowledged the power of self-conversation it's funny i was talking to my brother two weeks ago and i was like man i've never talked bad to myself even when i was obese even when i was homeless i just never talked bad to myself i never was like you're stupid how did you get in the situation? What were you thinking? You know, I'm always more like, you know what? You messed up. Let's go. We can do this again. Let's get up. Let's go. So to my younger self, I just say, keep, keep those conversations going. Keep talking positive to yourself. Acknowledge where you messed up. 
Because I think that's been my biggest lessons in the world. Like, oh, I messed up here. Okay, so when I go back now, I know what not to do. You know, so I acknowledge all my mess ups too, as well as the victories. And I think that's where it's helped me out tremendously. But I would tell myself, just keep, keep on the same path. You're on the right path. And, you know, thank you for believing in yourself because it, it led to what I'm doing now. There are times I'm like, oh man, I don't know if I can do that. But, you know, it's like, all right, well, we got to go try it at least. You know, if we want, if you want these results, there's a process in between there that you have to go through no matter who you are. And I've always wanted to achieve to be the best. So it's like, why not put in the work to be the best? There was a quote I saw, somebody's got to win. Why not me? Like somebody's going to win. Somebody's going to be at the top. Somebody, And I, I'm a big believer in like, we all can be up there. All of us. There's enough abundance for everybody to be at the top. But why not us? Like, let's go. Let's, let's go do the work we got to do. I got this sticker on me. This is my daughter. She went to gymnastics today. And so she was like, Poppy, you can have my sticker. And I was like, thank you, baby. Like, she was like, because you did a good job. And I was like, thank you. It says, well done. I, I try to instill that in my kids too. Like, believe in yourself, baby. You can do it. If you don't believe in yourself, why is somebody else going to believe in you? Like, you get it. You see that all the time. People are like, nobody believes in me. This and that. It's like, yeah, but you got to believe first. And then after you, the most powerful thing about believing in yourself is once you believe in yourself, you honestly don't care who believes in you. I would like for the younger generations to understand that they're not crazy for being loving. They're not crazy for caring. They're not crazy for understanding other people's plights, understanding other people's problems. Um, they're not crazy for actually giving a damn. I, you know, I interviewed Billy Eilish for the film, Genesis Butler, um, another vegan kid, amazing child. And just sitting down talking to these kids, they care about more than themselves. You got to care about yourself, but they care about more than themselves. And that's a beautiful thing to see. There's a dish I made up and I call it a badass, beautiful mess. And the reason why I call it a badass, beautiful mess is because it was when I was literally like, I didn't have any money. I had these certain uh, items in my house and I just looked at them. I was like, you know what? If I put this together, this is going to be amazing. And so it's a, a bed of quinoa uh, topped off with sweet plantains. Uh, topped off with grilled onions, topped off with guacamole, and um, that's it. Then for the dessert that I have with that, I call it bananas on a date. I take like two or three uh, bananas, chop them up, throw them in a bowl. I take about four or five dates with a little bit of water, some cinnamon, some nutmeg, blend that all together into like a sauce, pour that over the bananas, and top it with like some chopped almonds or pecans and then like some coconut shreds. Thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate that.